Well, thank you, Jack, for the reading of God's Word. Thank you for your presence tonight. Kind of stormy, and you hear a lot of coughing and sneezing. We've talked about the allergies this morning, but I'm glad you're here. I certainly am. And, you know, this morning I, we looked at Saul of Tarsus. We're going to look at the same man tonight, but we're going to look at him as Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. And, you know, let me say this about the, the gospel and how it came about. You know, in, in Romans 1, 16, Paul said, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God unto salvation, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The Lord said of himself, he said, I, was, I came to the house of Israel. To the lost house of Israel. That was his primary focus was to teach the Jews. The promise of salvation, the promise of a covenant relationship with God was to the Jew first. Most of us in this room this morning or this evening would find ourselves to be Gentile people. There's one or the other. You're either a Jew or you're a Gentile. And most of us would, would say that we're Gentile people in that we're not Jewish. But of course, as we know through the gospel, there is no Jew or Gentile anymore, is there? But I want you to understand there was a transition that had to be made. Think about this. For there are, has been one, two, three dispensations of time with God dealing with mankind. The first was the patriarchal uh, time. God spoke directly. He spoke directly to Noah. He spoke to Abraham. They were patriarchs and they were uh, the uh, patriarchal time. And then they go to the the, uh, they go to Egypt and they spend 400 years there and they come out and Moses is a lawgiver. And so they had the law and there was a transition from that one age to the other. And then when we get to Christianity, we see that Judaism to Christianity was a transition too. And what do we say about change? It's what? Hard, isn't it? Change is always hard. Um, these young kids know nothing but com the computer age. But if you're my age and older, you had to make that transition. And if you were like me, it wasn't easy. Now, I see a lot of 80 and 90-year-old people that are on Facebook, and they can do all these things, and my hat's off to them. I'm not one of them. But you understand transition is always something that comes about through change, and it usually comes about through difficulty. Well, Paul, for our study tonight, was the apostle to the Gentiles. Now we know in Acts 10 that Peter had an issue with Gentiles and the other, the, other, uh, decide, the other apostles, we don't even see them dealing with Gentiles. But Paul specifically from the Lord's mouth would be the apostle to the Gentiles. And that makes him very, very special to me, being a Gentile in, 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 my, in my heritage. And probably you are too. So we're gonna look at that this, uh, th this evening. Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles. What does that mean? Well, in Acts 9.10, we read where the Lord speaks to his servant Ananias concerning Paul. Okay, or Saul at this time, his name would be changed. Well, let me tell you something about Ananias. Was he just jumping at the chance to meet this man and talk to him? No, he wasn't. He even told the Lord, and you know, you think about when the Lord says go, and then you wait a minute, I've got something to talk about, and he did, and rightfully so. He said, Lord, I've heard bad things about this man. How that he has letters where he has come to a foreign city to arrest those that call upon your name. And he said, well, that's true. And as Jack read for us this evening, but he said he had a counter to Ananias for this, and, the, and, and I will read it again. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he's a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. No, I've got a job for him. You know, you go and talk to him. I know you're fearful of him, but hear me. You go to him and you talk to him because I have a job for him. It's kings and Gentiles and the, the uh, house of Israel. And what? What's the consolation prize? I'm going to show him the great things that he's going to suffer for the kingdom of God. The road to Damascus, and we're very familiar with that story, the blinding light and how that Paul came into contact with Christ. But that was not the first time the person of Paul came before Christ. We read in Galatians 1, uh, 15, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace. Paul, looking back 
on his life as we do too. I hope we do. You know, and it's best seen looking back over your shoulder. Providentially, how has God worked in your life? You know what's so sad? I've talked to some Christians and they said, you know, I don't really see where he's worked in my life providentially. Can you imagine saying that? I certainly can. Paul, looking back over the years, over his life, he realized that he was chosen before his birth. His whole life and how he lived, uh, where he was born, how he was educated, the manner of his life, the very nature of who he would be, would be meshed together with God's will to be, make an apostle of him, of Jesus Christ. He was called to be an apostle, not of merit either, and not by understanding. But Paul would say he was called to be an apostle of Christ by the grace of God. In chapter 1 of Acts, we see the qualifications of, a, of an apostle. I had a young man tell me one time, he said, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. I said, are you now? And he said, I sure am. And I said, you don't look old enough, and I don't see how you can qualify. And he said, well, what do you mean I'm not old enough? And I said, well, you'd have to be about 2,000 years old to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. And plus, you don't qualify. And he said, I didn't know there were any qualifications to be an apostle. And I said, yes, there is. And we'll see them in, in uh, Acts 1 there. Judas had betrayed the Lord. Judas had gone out and hung himself. And Peter quotes from the Psalms that it, someone should take his place. It was predicted that they would. So we know the story. They chose lots, and the lots fell upon a man named Matthias. But the qualifications were given there. And in verse 21 of Acts 1, Verse 21 of chapter 1, Therefore of these men who have accompanied us all the time that the Lord Jesus went out and amongst us. And verse 22, Beginning with the, from the baptism of John to the day when he was taken up from us, one of these must be a witness with us of his resurrection. And uh, as we said, Matthias was the one that was chosen by lots. If you break that down, what is he saying there? They must have been taught by Jesus. They must have been taught by the master the things that he would want us to, uh, to, to teach and to know. And most important, uh, the whole uh, Christianity hangs on this. They must have witnessed the resurrected Lord. Paul would say in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 5 through 8, he said there, he said about the resurrection, the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ, he said that he was seen. He gives us a chronological order there. He, that he was seen by Cephas, then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain, he says, to the, uh, to the present. But some had fallen asleep. Some had died that had seen Jesus. Years had gone by. But 500 saw him all at one time. After that, he was seen by James. That was his brother. And you know, we, as a, as a sideline, James was not a believer until he saw his brother resurrected. I'm telling you, the resurrected Lord changes everything because he was alive, and they killed him, and then he was alive again forevermore. And we will be too, as we discussed this morning. Amen. He said he was seen by James, and then by all the apostles, and last of all, he was seen by me also as one born out of due time. Paul said in Galatians 1.16, God revealed his son in me that I might preach him among the Gentiles. I did not, listen, listen to this. I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood, nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me, but I went to Arabia and returned again to Damascus. You know, we have that, you know, and it's just abbreviated, but we have that in uh, Acts 9 there, and, you know, Paul's conversion is found in Acts 9 and Acts 22 and Acts 26, and uh, various various things are added or are left off depending on which uh, which version you read, but one of them is that he went after his conversion and preached there in the city of Damascus. But what we find is you would get the idea that straightway he did that, but no, that was not the case. Paul would say in Galatians 1.18 that this was a three-year process in which he was taught by the resurrected Lord. How long did the apostles, how long were they with Jesus on earth? Three years. Isn't that odd? Isn't that ironic? Isn't that something that maybe perhaps Paul spent three years with the Lord too. He was taught in all ways. And I bring that up to this. Paul would defend his apostleship his entire life. And I think probably the number one reason he would defend it is because who was he an apostle to? The Gentile people. 
And the Jewish apostles, as we know, Peter had a big issue with that and had to be, he said he stood face to face and had to condemn him because he quit, uh, quit um, fellowshipping with Gentiles. They had a big problem with Gentiles. In Acts 15, we see they had a, count, they had a, a meeting that, uh, about the Gentiles coming into uh, Christianity. And um, that's another st uh, subject there. But uh, this man, Paul, I, what I'm trying to wrap my arms around and my brain around is he was an apostle to the Gentiles. Why was he? Why did God choose him specifically for this task? And hopefully this evening we will uh, we'll uncover that. You know, I've thought about many times what made him special, what made him, because we know he was a Jew of all Jews. You know, I mean, even this morning we looked at him. He was more zealous than all those Jews, more zealous than his Jewish teachers that had taught him. And yet you're going to take someone that radical, and they're going to be an apostle to the Gentile people. Absolutely, amen. And he was the right man for it. We're going to look at it this evening as we go. One of the things that made him right for this task, we find in Galatians 1.14, he said, I advanced in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries and in my own nation being more exceedingly zealous for the traditions of the Father. That tells us something of the nature of Paul, a fire-breathing man, a very much a zealot. Uh, there are many reasons I could see he was chosen. He was educated in the law, much more than, than your average Jewish Pharisee even. But he was at the cream of the cream. He was at the top of the the, uh, the pedestal in Judaism as far as his teaching and knowledge of God's word, the Old Testament. Um, and that would really be a factor. And you say, well, you, you know, you're pointing out a, something that's almost contrary. He was a, a, a Jew's Jew. He was the, the Hebrew of Hebrews. He was, he was this man educated in all these ways of Judaism. But what does it say in Luke 24, 45? Do you remember that? The Lord said to the, his other apostles, he said, the Holy Spirit, when he comes, he's going to open these scriptures to you that you'll understand them all the better. And Paul, having such great knowledge, when that happened with him too, his open knowledge of all the prophecies of the Old Testament, how that they pointed to the Messiah and pointed to Christ, he would be, uh, he would be uh, uh, way ahead of everyone else as far as his knowledge. He was fluent in at least three languages that we know of, at least three, Hebrew, Greek, and Arabic. He was a Roman citizen. That made him very unusual in his day and time for a Jew. He was a Roman citizen, and he was, he was that by birth. He was born in a city called Tarsus. He was known in Judaism as a fire breather, as we said, and, and now he's a convert. You know, I've noticed this. Uh, I was raised in the church. I was converted just like you were, whether you were raised in the church or not. We all have to be converted, don't we? We all have to come to the realization, as Ed said in his prayer, we all fall short of God, don't we? We've all fall, fallen short of God, and certainly we realize that before we obeyed the gospel. And that's the reason we obeyed the gospel, because we know that we've fallen short. And uh, now he's a convert. And what's so beautiful about Paul is this. He brought it all over with him. All that enthusiasm, all that zeal, all that fire breathing that he had in Judaism... He repented, obeyed the gospel, and then brought all that same uh, uh, into uh, and zeal into Christianity, making him a perfect apostle for the task that he had at hand. That would make him perfect. With that kind of uh, speech, that kind of education, that kind of uh, attitude, it would make him perfect man to stand before kings and to stand before Gentile rulers and stand before the house of Israel. We owe so much to that man, and I'm going to get to it in a minute. I'm going to point out what he's done and then how it affects us. He wrote 13 of the epistles in the New Testament, 27 letters in the New Testament. He wrote 13 of them. And if he's the author of Hebrews, he wrote 14. Okay? 1 Corinthians 9.1, Paul said this, Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ the Lord? Are you not the work? of mine in the Lord, always defending who he was, always having to defend who, that he was an apostle. But he, he has the same claim there as the other apostles. What had they seen? The resurrected Lord. We looked this morning that on the, the Sea of Tiberias. It's the third time the resurrected Lord appeared into those men. And Paul said, I've seen him too. I've sat in his presence. I was taught by him as well. Am I not an apostle? Are you not my work in the Lord? Galatians 1.1, 1, 1, Paul, an apostle, not of men. 
not through man, but of Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. I am a legit, validated apostle, and he would have to defend that always. Not with me, but with those of his day and age. The Spanish-American philosopher George Santanayana observed that those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Thus the saying we say today, history does what? It repeats itself. Paul's, of, Paul's apostleship was disputed by Judaizers and Gentiles of his day. Uh, and for this short time I've got left, I want to look at the reasons why. First of all, I want to talk about the two law systems. I've already talked about it a little bit. The transition from the patriarchal period to the law. And now we're looking at the transition between the law and Christianity. But I want to, I want to look at the Jew. And I want to talk about him a minute. The Jews, what did Moses bring down from Mount Sinai? The Ten Commandments, those laws on stone. And those were certainly amended and added to. You know, the first five books of the Bible are called what? The law. And there's just umpteen, you know, just hundreds of laws on how to live and how to quarantine yourself if you're unhealthy and if you have, you know, just all aspects of the food to eat and all these things. And Moses wrote this 1,500 years before Jesus Christ. They had had a law system for 15 centuries teaching them how to be better people, how to be in a covenant relationship with God. You know what a covenant means? It means an agreement. It means an accord. It means they were in the right relationship with Jesus, okay, or with God. And it taught them, and I think about this, it taught the Jewish people about morality. It taught about loving your neighbor as yourself. It taught about one God, not multiple gods, one God, one God overall. Holy days, the Sabbath, giving, how to give, how to leave some stuff in the field where you're, the poor man who comes through can glean from it. Uh, it showed them how to be that good neighbor, how to worship God, how not to worship God. Family. Well, how important family is. God taught them that through the law. Honesty. How to be honest. Taught them about sin. What sin was. Taught them about repentance. Taught them about marriage. How a man and a wife and their family, how they should be in marriage. And et cetera. On and on and on. And, you know, oftentimes we think about how that a new transition such as the old law was fulfilled. And nailed to the cross and Christianity dawn and it's the last. There'll be no other more, there'll be no more dispensations of, uh, of time as far as the relationship with God that we're in the last days. But we often think if we're not careful, especially being of that Gentile mind, I think we get to thinking that that was a bad system and it was lost. And because of all that, that change came about. That's not the case. I want you to understand something. Those Jews that lived, those Hebrews that lived and died under that law system, and we're in a covenant relationship with God, and adhered to the law, they're saved, just like we're going to be saved. The blood of Christ goes back and saves them. Those that were in that covenant relationship, those that understood the law, those that read it and practiced it, they were saved just like we are. And never forget that. What about the Gentiles? What about our forefathers? What written laws did they have? What things did they have? What could they, what could they hold up and say, this is how you worship God? They didn't have that, did they? Let's go back to the good Jew a minute. There's some things in the Bible that can make us think that. Remember Nathaniel? He would become an apostle. Remember in John 1, Jesus saw Nathaniel coming toward him and he said, Behold an Israelite indeed, whom is no deceit. What a compliment. Oh, I wish God would compliment me that way. He saw this man. And he said, there's no deceit in him. He's a good man. He's a good Jew. In Acts 10, remember the story there with Cornelius? You know, Peter was sent from Joppa to go and talk to the Gentiles. Do you think he was apprehensive about it? Very much so. God sent him a vision. Remember the sheet that came down? He sent him a vision to help him get there, to help him understand that the Gentiles have a shot in this too. A voice in, in Acts 10, 13 and 14, a voice came to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have not eaten anything common or unclean. This is a grown man now. This is a grown man. 
And we looked this morning, it, it's, you know, there's so many different aspects you could preach on Peter or Paul, depending on, or depending on what aspect you want to teach on. And this morning we looked at his sinful nature. But this evening I want to look at this. He was a good man. He was a, a good covenant Jew. And he's an, older, he's an older man at least in his probably 30s or 40s. And what does he say? I've never done that. I've never eaten anything unclean. I've never eaten anything uh, like that. And uh, the Lord's, in, in this case, is signifying that don't call anything common unclean. The, the Gentiles are like you. They have a, they're, they're to be brought in the kingdom, and, and we know that story. The purpose of me bringing this up was he was a covenant living Jew. So was Nathaniel. And those Jews had those, those laws. But what about the Gentiles? What written law did they have? What code did they live by? Well, for all the reasons aforementioned of Paul, he was the perfect man for this task. He would write the Christian laws for a people who had not known God or his righteous. No, he would write to a people who were pagans, who were idolaters, ones who involved sex in their worship of multi-gods, one who ate blood of strangled animals, sacrificed to their idols, and I could go on and on. What did they know of God? They knew nothing of one God. What did they know of marriage? They believed in the, plural, uh, the uh, plurality of marriage. The, the Gentiles did. I would argue the point with you even in 1 Timothy 3, and I know there's different thoughts on that about the qualifications of an elder, but if you'll remember there, he says they must be the husband of one wife. And who was he writing that to? A Gentile church. I think that, that that is a possibility that some of those Christian people coming out, making that transition uh, from one law to another, that they had uh, plural wives. We know the uh, J Jews of old did. It doesn't seem they did in the time of Christ, but the Gentiles certainly did. What did they know of family? What did they know of faith? Nothing. Nothing. What did they know of repentance, forgiveness, heaven? Nothing. Your people, my people, 2,000 years ago, wherever they were, I, I doubt anyone in this room could, pa could uh, trace their genealogy much more than four or five generations, but we didn't just appear from Mars, did we? We've been on this earth a long time. Our people have, haven't they? What did they know of these things? What about God? Did he love them too? Yes, he did. And it was a time to bring them into the fold, wasn't it? Paul would write this code, as we pointed out, he, point, he wrote at least 13 epistles, maybe 14 epistles, to teach us better, to teach us the way of God. Paul's writing was not only to them, but as we find out, it, it was to all, wasn't it? In Galatians 3, 26 and 29, he says, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There's neither male nor female, for you're all in Christ Jesus, and if you're in Christ Jesus, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Oh, don't you see the big picture? Don't you see how the, that it finally came and was locked together? There were those of old and there were those pagans, and then now through Christ and through putting on Christ, we're no longer Jews. We're no longer Gentiles. Ladies, we're living in a day and time that's uh, disturbing. I know it is to you and it is to me. Uh, women's roles, not in the church, we're going to talk about that, but women's roles in, in, uh, in politics and women's roles in society. And there, there's conflict there, but not in Christ. Men, there's, uh, there, there, there's issues in society about our roles and, 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 and how we've done and how we ought to do in this, but not in Christ. And we're not living in a day and time, and I thank God for it, but we're not living in a day and time in America of slavery. But you know, at the time of this writing, 90% of that Roman world was slaves. 90% were slaves. What would it be like to be a slave? What would it be like to know that you, your family could be uprooted and your children, who you love, they love their children just like you love, could be separated and sold away from you? We can't imagine that, can we? But you know what? They could obey the gospel to a slave can. Onesimus, remember him? 
What was the relationship he would have in God? This is, this is the most, some of the most wonderful scriptures there. There are no slaves. There are no women. There are no men. There are no Jews. There are no uh, Gentiles. We're all one people in, through God. And then in doing so, that makes us Abraham's seed. We're grafted into those promises that were promised to them. Well, through this wonderful man... In his writings of Christ, he would unite the world together. And we've talked about that, making one people. I talked to you about history repeating itself. If you would, listen to me for a few minutes, what I've got to say. It's really the reason I wrote this sermon. There is a trend today. And the same thing has reared its ugly head. But I want to talk about why. You know, members of what once were the members of the Church of Christ... They're out there taking their names off the sign. They're calling themselves the church of whatever street they're, they're on. They're taking Christ off. Why? I'll tell you why. They don't want to be associated with us because they, they don't like what the church of Christ doctrine teaches any longer. And, uh, but it's not a new trend. I want you to know that. We're looking at it 2,000 years ago. It was the trend of that day. And what it does, it comes up every generation and you know what that generation of, uh, of apostates say? They have to say it sooner or later. If you don't like the laws, and you don't like the admonishment, and you don't like the rules, and you don't like the regulations, you want to de- uh, live different. Well, if everything stays the same, then what are you living in? Sin, aren't you? Because you're not following the laws. You're not following the, the, uh, the written word. So you change it. But there, you can do one better than that if you're really smart and you'll get a bunch of people together. Discredit the writer. Say he wasn't inspired. Say like they said of old, he's not an apostle. Yeah, let's do that. Did you know, can you believe that, that that's going on today? In congregations that were once the Lord's body, they're saying now, he wasn't an apostle. Uh, I don't like what he had to say because it really conflicts on the way I want to live. And I can give you some examples. They want to extend the roles of women in worship where the Bible says specifically these are their roles. They say, uh uh-uh. Now we want something different than that. They change the worship God has said, and Paul wrote in, in Ephesians and Colossians, that we are to sing with our voices and, and through our heart, make melody. They said, no, we don't want that. We like mechanical instruments. We like what's modern. We like what, you know, a lot of these places have guitars and drums, and they even do the smoke. And, the, you know, it's a, it's a theatrical show. And, you know, if I went, went to a concert on Friday night, I wouldn't have any problems with that, but not in worship because we're instructed to do different, aren't we? But they don't like that. Uh, adherence to the Lord's Supper. You know, when I was a kid, I took it every Sunday. I don't want to do that anymore. Let's either not do it at all or let's do it sometime once a year, twice a year. You know, if you'll remember in John 6 what the Lord says that, if you don't eat my body and drink my blood, you have no life in you. They dismiss that and they want, uh, they want something different. And they accept denominational faith. There's many aspects of faith there's many paths unto God and that's directly contrary to God's word isn't it but they teach that oh well I don't look at the sign I don't care what it says I don't even care what the preacher says all I know is we're all okay they reject the teaching of multi-marriages too you can be married and divorced as many times you want if you understood you know and I didn't as a young man but I do today my wife and I were talking about today somebody specifically came up today and, oh, it was an interview we watched on TV, and this 70-year-old man gets up there, a uh, very famous man, and he breaks down. He starts crying. And he said, um, my dad left my mother when I was five years old. He used to hold me up and sing to me, and now, you know, he left. And here he was, that was 65 years ago, and he's still broken hard about it. Divorce is so bad. And they don't care. You know, you can have multi-marriages for any reason. And they, uh, they reject his teaching on morality, too. You know, let's live together for a couple years, and if it all works out, maybe we'll get married then. 
And they go to church just like that. And everybody's okay with it there. Uh, live and do what you want to do, basically. And this is the one that probably gets me the most. You know, being a minister and an elder, I go to a lot of funerals. And uh, many funerals of people that are no association with the Lord, no association with church. But there's one thing that I'm noticing, and I've seen this trend, and you probably have too. You know, we kind of joke, and we shouldn't even joke like that because it's not funny, but in the office, you know, we say, I think it's a Walt Disney thing, but all dogs go to heaven. You know, and we say that, but they teach that everybody goes to heaven. And very few, I mean very few, go to hell. Did you know that's the opposite of what the Bible says? Jesus said, few there be. It's a straight and narrow way, and a few go that way. And broad and wide is the other way, and many go. They teach the exact opposite of that. Everybody goes to heaven, and very few. Maybe the, the worst of the worst might go to hell. In 1 Corinthians 15 and 3, Paul said, For I delivered you first of all that which I also received. Who did he receive it from? From Christ. He didn't make this stuff up. He didn't dream it up. He said, I delivered you what I received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scripture, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scripture. Paul message, Paul's message was the exact same as the other apostles, and it came about the same way it was revealed taught to him by Jesus Christ, just like these other apostles were taught. Why is Paul rejected? Why is Peter not rejected? Why were the other apostles? Because Paul wrote the Christian law to the Gentile people who had no law, no written law, who had no code, no written code. And I think that the same people that 2,000 years ago that had a hard time with it have a hard time with it today. Because wouldn't it be nice to run your own show? You know, these kids over here that are still at home, I know what you're thinking because I thought that too. I, I used to think, I cannot wait to get out of here and run my own show. And you're going to find out that running your show is, uh, is uh, uh, it's got some issues with running your own show. And this has issues with running your own show. When you want to run your own show and not listen to God, look out. And that's what's going on today. And I very seldom get up here and lambash any, by any certain group. And I'm not. But I'm just saying this is disturbing because it, it, it's really trendy today, isn't it? I've inquired and asked those that reject. You know, I've had conversations with people that were once members of the church and then they've gone this different way. And I've talked to them about it. I've, uh, and... Uh, uh, I ask them why they reject Paul's teaching, and they say, uh, and uh, they answer usually the same. He stated his own opinion, is what they'll say. He spoke of the culture of that day, and not for our time. His message clashed with the other Bible writers. No, it didn't. And to that, I'll let God's work speak for itself. What did Jesus say in John 12, 48? He who rejects me and does not receive my words has that which judges him. That word I have spoken will judge him in the last day. You know, Jesus made it very clear in John 5. The things that I speak are just what the Father told me to speak. The things the apostles spoke were just what Christ instructed them and they received from him. Peter would say this in 1 Peter 1, 20 and 21, knowing this first, that no prophecy or scripture is ever of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke it as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. There's your inspiration. And uh, in John 4, 26, Jesus promised the helper, the Holy Spirit, when the Father will send, whom the Father will send in my name, and he will teach you all things and, be, and bring to remembrance all the things that I've said. That was the purpose. He brought the remembrance of the things that Jesus had taught them. That's what the Holy Spirit did. Paul was an apostle, and Paul, uh, being taught by Jesus, um, had seen the resurrected Lord, and uh, he was inspired and moved by the Holy Spirit, just like the other apostles. I personally am not ashamed of Paul. I'm very proud of this man. We owe him everything as Gentile people. We owe him everything. He gave us a law. He gave us a, uh, through inspiration, and gave us a code that we didn't have before. And uh, 
I'm proud of his zeal too and for his heart. And he's shown me something through his life that we can change, can't we? We can change. He certainly did. He had to overcome a huge change that we looked at this morning. Uh, we were once far away from God as Gentiles, but through Christ he's blotted out our transgressions and nailed them to the cross, hasn't he? You know, in Hebrews uh, 10 and 39, those Jews were wanting to go back to what they knew because of persecution. They were being persecuted on every hand because they had been converted. They had changed from Judaism to Christianity. And now the writer there, he's admonished them, don't go back. He spent 10 chapters systematically showing this is what Judaism is and this is how much more perfect it is in Christ. And he tells them in, in uh, Hebrews 10, 39, but we're not of those that draw back into perdition, but those that believe in the saving of the soul. You know, I didn't look up the scripture, but I recall it in Hebrews. That writer there says, there was a time. Now think about this. There was a time then you, you took great joy in, in losing your things, things that were taken from you. But you had so much better to live for. You had Christ. You had salvation. And uh, yeah, sure, you suffered things. Sure, you lost things but for a much better way. Now they're wanting to go back. That's basically what's happening today in the apostasy in the church, is they're wanting to go back really to the Gentile world, to doing what comes natural. But that's not enough to just say, I'd rather just live in sin and leave it at that. No, no, no. We're going to live any way we want to. We'll worship any way we want to. We'll have any theology we want to. And we'll say God authorizing. and God's good about it. But it hasn't gone unnoticed. Nothing we do in life goes unnoticed. Peter would say in 1 Peter 4, 3 and 4, for we've spent enough time, we've spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lewdness and lust and drunkenness and revelries and drinking parties and abominable, uh, abominable idolatries, in regard to these, they think it's strange that you don't run with them in the same flood of dispensation, speaking evil of you. Let them speak. Let them say what they want to. But I want to walk in the grace of God, don't you? Amen. You know, don't let them lead you away with false hope. Because, and, and where I really speak to this is you guys. Because I was young once and thought I had all the answers. And, but you're going to run on the people that are, you're going to admire maybe. You know, the, the, us older ones have uh, been disillusioned so many times, we're probably not going to let it happen to us anymore, I hope. But young people usually are the ones that get caught up in this. For one, they're young and they have that, that, they have that uh, camaraderie with each other that they want to do certain things. And all it takes is a false teacher to say, you know, God's okay with that too. You can do that. But God's okay with what he instructed you to do. That's what God's okay with. And so oftentimes we see that, and it's amazing to me, it seems like music is the big trend. That's usually the... The downside is to you. I love music just like many of you, maybe even more. But music's one thing. You know, our life on this earth is one thing, and worship to God and adherence to his law is another. And so um, don't get caught up with that. Don't, be, uh, don't let them uh, entice you to trample underfoot the blood and sacrifice of Jesus. Well, I'm about out of time, and I hope that this message came about right. I don't normally ever get up here and speak contrary to something else, or I try not to. There's enough good news in the Bible just to preach on that. But uh, I've been in the church um, five, five decades, and like I said, I was converted just like you. And uh, being an elder and a minister, I probably see and hear and converse with more people than you do on a day-to-day day, day basis about these subjects. And I find it extremely uh, discouraging to see people that I love, people that I've known over the years, and they've changed. And they don't even care to debate it with you. They don't even care to defend it. All they know is they've, they've uh, surrounded themselves by the like-minded, like we have too, and that's the camp that they're in. And I'll tell you why it's so disturbing to me. There's a judgment day coming. There is a judgment day, and there, there are no secrets on this earth. There's nothing that's not going to be exposed in that day. And I don't want my self-will to keep me from God's will. I don't want something that I 
like, I'm not going to take some, you know, I have things that I like that have nothing to do with, uh, with church, you know, I think hobbies that I have and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, I like to hunt. I'm going to use that for an example. I like to hunt. So what would y'all think about next Sunday? Let's all wear in camo and painting up her face and bring that theme of hunting into here. I would hope that you'd say, what has that got to do with worship? Some of you are cowboys. You like to rope and ride, as the song says. So why don't we just make this next, next Sunday, why don't we make this about being a cowboy? Everybody wear hats and chaps, and we'll put a water trough out. And if you want to, let's go as far as to bring trailers with horses and calves and goats up here. What's that got to do with God's laws? What if we, and I could just go on and on, couldn't I? What if I just... You know, your life and my life is wonderful. We can have those hobbies. We can do those things. But we don't need, that, that doesn't, uh, that doesn't um, compare to this, does it? God has told us exactly what he wants. He's told us exactly how to do it. And it's about worshiping him, isn't it? Well, there's the lesson tonight. What about you? Are you a Christian tonight? Have you made that decision? If you haven't, you can. You know, the Bible says in Romans 9 that confession is part of salvation, isn't it? To confess before men that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And uh, we need to repent of our sins, too. That's, uh, that's paramount that we do that. We have to change. Uh, the Lord said in Luke 13, 3, unless you repent, you'll perish. So that's very, very much a part of it. You know, I looked at one religion. I just went on the, went on the Internet and looked it up. Uh, about, about how to become a member of that, and there was nothing about repentance. And that's not, let's just take repentance. You know, repentance is an ugly thing to have to do anyway. Let's just take it out. No, we must repent, or we'll likewise perish. And then to the Jew and to the Gentile of that day, they all came into Christ the same way through baptism, through confessing and repenting of their sins, and then putting Christ on reenacting his death, burial, and resurrection. We read about that in so many places, Acts 2.38, Romans 6, uh, Titus 3, and so many other places. And if you haven't done that, why haven't you? Boy, tonight would be a good night to do that. What about your sins? Do you ever think about them? You know, we do have them. We all fall short of God's glory, don't we? Maybe there's something going on in your life you need to address. Maybe you've tried to address it and you had difficulty with it. Well, you've got your brethren here to help you. If there's something in your life that you want to come up tonight and talk about, do so. Uh, don't be afraid. We're all in the same boat, aren't we, trying to get to heaven. Come up here and we'll talk about it. We'll pray for you. If you have any needs to, this evening that we can help you with, come as together we stand and sing.